scripture reading today is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. The word of the Lord. Uh, ha- Whoa. An extra special Happy Mother's Day from my mic. Um, well, uh, it's great to be together. If we haven't met, uh, my name's Andy. I'm the lead pastor here. We're excited uh, to be together as uh, always. Now, uh, looking back about 15 years ago, uh, one of my, uh, the first churches where I worked, I was on staff in this amazing uh, multi-generational team. On one end of the spectrum, there were seven of us interns who were 18 to 22 years old and bought 18 to 22 year old energy. And on the other end of the spectrum, we had seven people who were in their sort of late 60s, uh, retired volunteer staff and everything in between. Our staff meetings were like Thanksgiving dinner every single week in all of the good and bad ways that that might be true. Now, of that group of uh, seven people at the older end of the spectrum, they were an incredible group of people. Uh, There were three couples and one widow in the group, and out of those seven, six of them were just full of wisdom, they exuded peace, they had this steadfast, stabilizing influence on the church, they helped to steward this amazing move of God where hundreds and hundreds of people were coming to faith in Jesus, they were experiencing healing, they were transforming the community uh, that we were a part of. That was true of six of them. One of the seven, though, while still bringing a lot to the table, a lot of skill, a lot of knowledge, really stood out because that person was sort of this constantly anxious presence. He was hard to relate with. He had something to prove. He had to uh, be worked around in a lot of cases. It's not that it's horrible. He brought things to the table, but there was this huge difference between the six and the one. You would go to the six for wisdom, counsel, prayer. When you needed a peaceful influence on your life, you would seek them out. Not so much the one. So what made a difference? What made the six the way they were and the one the way he was? Well, we're going to explore uh, that today. We're coming to the end this week and next week of our teaching series, Faith for Every Season. And the goal of this whole series has been to help us have faith that lasts. 
And what we believe is that to have faith that lasts, we have to grow in spiritual self-awareness. We have to understand what it means to live in the reality that God is present in every season, whether or not that season feels the same or different than before. And one of the ways we do that is by identifying where are we at on the journey? Where are we at on the, the spiritual growth map? And what we do is steward whatever that season is. We agree and join with God in saying yes to what he's doing in that time. And so we've been looking over these last weeks at this tool uh, called the critical journey, which is one way to look at the journey of faith. We've looked at uh, most of these uh, different parts of the journey now. And last week, Matthew went pretty deeply into this idea of the dark night of the soul or what the critical journey calls the wall. And I've heard, uh, I wasn't here, but I've heard from a huge number of you uh, how God met you in a profound way uh, through that teaching. And this week is sort of a part two on that same idea. We're focusing now not so much on what is the dark night of the soul, but actually how do we journey through it and beyond it? How do we not get stuck there in the wilderness season? Now, the interesting thing is the dark night of the soul is one of those things that is hard to sort of convey and communicate if you haven't actually been through it. Uh, the other day, I was having lunch uh, with my friend Francisco, and he was telling me how earlier in his life, he hiked the entire uh, length of the Grand Canyon. It's called the, the Rim to Rim Hike. And for him, it was this breathtaking, uh, life-changing experience. For me, I've never been to the Grand Canyon, and so the best that I can do is look at a photo. Or I can think about the last time I went on a strenuous hike, but it really doesn't overlap. The same is sort of true for the dark night of the soul. There's a vast difference between knowing about it and actually going through it. And so if you're in a place today where you're not in the dark night of the soul, that's good, bless you. Um, perhaps you've never felt like you've been there. If that's you, I'd encourage you, just take these two messages, take these two weeks as sort of tools in your tool belt for when you do get there, because bad news, you will at some point. At its most basic level, the dark night of the soul is any time that God seems distant. Maybe he seems far away or silent. That distance could be a result of tangible trials in your life, circumstantial things, tragedies, sickness, loss of a loved one, divorce. Or it could simply be that your faith feels dry when before it felt very engaged. And in some ways, that last type is actually the hardest, right? It's easier to say, yes, I'm in a dark night of the soul when there's this tangible experience of suffering that we're walking through. It's less easy to identify and say that when our experience is sort of more spiritual apathy or spiritual disengagement from the things of God. Right? Maybe you've become jaded or disillusioned in some way. Maybe you're still holding on to God, but it really is just holding on. Faith that was once passionate now feels kind of muted. Often we misidentify that kind of moment. Right? We call it realism or maturity. We say, you know, our passionate days of faith were our days of youth, and now by contrast we've grown up, and so our stoicism and skepticism is warranted. Right? We're intellectually superior to that other time in our life. If that's where you are today, a sort of place of spiritual disengagement, maybe you're in this room solely out of a sense of duty, or maybe you're someone's child and you're dragged here for Mother's Day involuntarily. If that's you, uh, I want to suggest that what might be happening for you is actually this thing that we're calling a dark night of the soul. Right, that that's just as true for you if you're just in this kind of, ah, I'm spiritually apathetic place. You're just as much in a dark night of the soul of someone who's experienced tragic loss. It can look all kinds of different ways, and the Lord wants to meet all of those different ways it looks in you and for you and for your goodness. The dark night of the soul isn't a literal one-night experience, but it's this part of the critical journey that we've called the journey inward that really represents a choice. 
It says, will we hold on to the self, to our own desires, agendas, plans, and striving? Will we do that? Or on the flip side, will we embrace the idea of surrender? Will we allow God to reveal the truth about us? Will we relax into his very best, good, and perfect will for us? Because on the one hand, if we resist, what we find is that we get stuck. We run into the wall over and over and over again. Nothing ever seems to change. By the way, that's probably what was going on for the one out of seven I talked about earlier. On the other hand, though, we can embrace what God is doing, and as we do that, experience these three things. We can experience security, deep inner security, an identity that can't be shaken. We can experience peace that's pervasive, inner peace and outer peace, right? What is often called being a non-anxious presence. We can experience wisdom, in our lives. You can become a wise person. Wisdom that comes from faithfully journeying with God time after time after time and seeing his faithfulness, seeing his provision, seeing his breakthrough. When I look at people who've journeyed through the dark night of the soul and come out on the other side, these are the three consistent features of their lives. And the good news is that every single one of us can access these very same things. You don't have to be of a particular uh, age. It's not something that's only true in the second half of life, although that's common. The only requirement is a willingness to walk with Jesus through your dark night of the soul rather than avoid it or fight it. So uh, in today's teaching text, we meet uh, the Apostle Paul in his own uh, dark night of the soul. He's writing from a Roman prison. Uh, This is believed to be the actual Roman prison uh, where Paul was. He's awaiting a trial before the authorities, perhaps even the emperor. And he's writing in Philippians to new believers in the city of Philippi, which is in modern day Greece. And he's wrestling with the fact that the end of his life might be imminent. He might be executed quite soon by the Roman authorities, right? Broadly, they're persecuting Christians, but Paul is very much the ringleader, and they've gone after him. And so in these verses, we get these insights into his thinking about the dark night. We get to see how he journeyed through it, and how even through that, he can say things which seem crazy and counterintuitive, even though he's right in the middle of the trial. He says ridiculous things like this, verse 12, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He says, and yes, because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. Famous verse, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then uh, in verse 25, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, right? He's more concerned with the growth of these followers than he is with his own circumstances. You have to ask, is Paul crazy? Is he at leasting himself? Is he completely deluded about the circumstances that he finds himself in? Like he's in prison, soon to be executed. These don't sound like the words of a person in that situation. And yet, don't you see how these words represent for Paul what? They represent security, they represent peace, and they represent wisdom. These three things that come from the dark night of the soul are things that are pervasive in his life. Aren't they things that you'd love to be pervasive in your life? Just me. Anyone? (laughs) At the end of your life, however near or far that is, wouldn't it be incredible for the things that someone would stand up and say about you to be, that person was a person who was so secure. That person was a person who just, peace was with them everywhere they went. That person was full of wisdom. Wouldn't you love that, someone to say that about you at the end of your life or even write it on your headstone? Wouldn't that be an incredible testimony of the work of God in your life? What we see in scripture is that these things most often only occur when we faithfully wait and walk through the dark night of the soul or the wilderness season. We sometimes get glimpses of them before that, 
We sometimes get little hints of that in our life, but for them to be consistent and to be deeply rooted, we have to walk with Jesus through our circumstances, our pain, even our disillusionment. So how do we do that? Well, the simple answer is to say yes to what God is doing in that particular season of your life to allow him to lead you. But the deeper answer is that as human beings, we try to solve the dark night of the soul in all kinds of ways. Don't know about you, I am a solution-oriented person. I want to fix things. I want to make things better. And very often, what that does is actually cause me to resist what God is doing in my life rather than embrace it. It causes me to avoid and, uh, and run away from what God is doing rather than say yes to it. And so what we're going to look at in the rest of our time are five false assumptions about getting to the other side of the wilderness. Five things that can trip us up. Five things that if we don't avoid them will keep us running into that wall again and again and again. Something that we don't want to do. So to get to the other side of the wilderness, we have to not think that it's avoidable, that it's outside of God's will, that you can work your way out of it, that the main goal is for it to end, and that life will be the same afterward. So, letter A, it's avoidable. To state the obvious, as human beings, we do not like pain, mostly. Whether experiencing it for ourselves, watching other people go through pain, and we also live in a part of the world, right? New York City and Westchester County, we, we love to pretend that everything is great when it's not. Right? We love to project an image that everything is wonderful all of the time. When someone asks how you're doing, you automatically respond, fine, good, right? When really we know no one's actually asking how we're doing. Actually, earlier this week, someone was like, how was your weekend? And I made the mistake of replying honestly. I said, oh, it's just okay, not great, not terrible. I could see from the look on their face, like, no, I didn't want to know that. Why are you telling me this information? <laughs> Oh, we were just saying hi, okay. <laughs> right, we project this image of competence, right? Even if things aren't great, I can work through it, it's all good. Or maybe you grew up in a faith environment where this idea of the dark night of the soul for things not to be okay is not okay. It's not okay to talk about pain or spiritual dryness or feeling far from God, even in some churches, right? You might be judged as having a lack of faith or being weak or not having spiritual resolve. And so we avoid the idea altogether. Or maybe in a different way, you're someone, you look around the world, and you see that in relative terms, you think, well, I actually have it pretty good. Right, I have a roof over my head, I have food to eat, I have some discretionary income maybe, others don't have that, so really my dark night of the soul, it's a first world problem, I just need to get over it and be grateful. For all of these various different reasons and others too, I've seen so many Christians over the years avoid this whole idea of the wilderness season or the dark night of the soul. They refuse even at times to admit that it's happening, and so they never get to the other side. They say stuck or they bail out. And yet the truth is that part of Christian maturity is this part of the journey. Right? It was true for Moses, it was true for David, it was true for Ruth and Mary and the Apostle Paul, and guess who? Jesus. Do you think that you don't have to go through something that Jesus was willing to go through? If we want to become Christ-like followers, this is an inevitable, unavoidable part of the journey. Paul is here in Philippians 1 saying, I am in chains for Christ. He's saying this is part of the Christian life. If you came forward for, um, for prayer last week, you were saying, I recognize this is not avoidable. Yes, this is where I am right now. And just that act, just that act of saying, I recognize I'm in the dark night of the soul. I recognize I'm in the wilderness is actually an act of faith. It's a demonstration of maturity in Christ. I want to encourage you that coming for prayer, you can do that later, that showing vulnerability, opening up to your small group or Christian friends, those are countercultural, courageous acts. They're not a sign of weakness, they're a sign of health. Now, I want to be clear, it's not that following Jesus is supposed to be this constant and never-ending struggle. 
right? The advertisement isn't, follow Jesus, your life will be so much worse, right? It's not that. But it is to say, journeying with Jesus through the difficulties of life is an essential part of the Christian journey, one that we often try to sneak out of or rationalize away. Speaking of rationalizing it away, the second thing we need to avoid is thinking that it's outside of God's will, right? Our natural tendency is to buy into the world's vision of the good life, where everything is always up and to the right. We assume that God's will and our will are exactly the same, that he wants to give us a life that's easy, a life where we're always on an emotional high, a life where the primary narrative and story of our life is one of success, whether it's financial or career or family or whatever success. And then we apply all of those same metrics to our life of faith as well. As such, when, again, not if, but when, we experience the dark night of the soul, we assume this can't possibly be God's will for me, I gotta get out of it. Again, to be clear, we trust in the goodness of God, right? In most cases, the suffering that occurs in our life is a result of someone else's or our own sin. It's a result of the systems of this world. It's a result of the enemy and spiritual attack. But what we miss sometimes when we adopt the narrative of the world is that God does actually allow those things, and he uses them redemptively for our good. Paul Zone, the executive director of the Center for Faith and Work, says it this way. He says, the myth is, if it's uncomfortable, it can't be your calling. But the truth is, bearing the cross is an integral part of your calling. Very often, we think that the myth is the truth. But that's why the Apostle Paul can say, these chains have actually served to advance the gospel. Because of my chains, others have become confident in the Lord. The gospel is being proclaimed. Look at all of the goodness, says the Apostle Paul, that the Lord is bringing out of my season of trial. Again, did God delight in Paul's imprisonment? No. But he did use it. He used it for Paul's good, and he used it for the advancement of the gospel. God allows... He says yes to, he says okay to our dark nights of the soul. Why? So that he can work within them in us. So that he can meet us and so he can lead us into deeper trust. It causes us to ask the question, do I believe that God knows what is best for me better than I do? Do I believe that God knows what is best for me better than I do? And honestly, I hate that question. <laughs> I hate it so much. Everything in my flesh, perhaps yours even right now, reacts against that question. I don't want to acknowledge humanly that God actually does know better. Why? I want what I freaking want. I want the life that I would design for myself. I want all of the unhealthy and dis disordered desires that are in my heart, I want them to be completely fine. I want him to give me all of the stuff. <laughs> no part of me wants to admit that he knows better, but he does. <laughs> right, but in my flesh, I'm arrogant enough to think that I know better than the God of the universe. And I'm sorry to break it to you, but so do you, whether you admit it or not but he does actually know what's best. And in his knowing what's best, he's actually under no obligation to explain himself. Read Job uh, 38 to 41, it's a whole other sermon, but God goes through all of the many, many reasons why he's under no obligation to explain himself and to explain why what he says is best is actually best. Because when God leads us into these wilderness, hard, difficult, dry places, he's actually doing something deeply in us that we would never do or ask for ourselves. And so if you're in that place right now, if you're in the dark night of the soul, I want you to know God is doing something. Say that to your heart right now if you're in that place. God is doing something. He has you there for reason and purpose. 
Now, did he send or ordain your suffering? Probably not. But in his power and mercy, he's going to use that thing to bring about growth and goodness in your life. He will. He will. That's his promise. Thirdly, an assumption to avoid is that you can work your way out of it. Verses 15 through 17 are so uh, interesting. You perhaps wondered even why we were reading them. Uh, They describe this group of people in the first century who are preaching the gospel, but they're doing it so that Paul would get in more trouble. It's this really odd addition to the passage, but he talks about it presumably because his readers were aware of this group and what they were doing. And in verse 18, we see that he he has this incredible response. Even while this strange group is working their hardest to try and rub salt in his wounds, how's he responding? He's responding with the fruit of the dark night of the soul. He responds with peace and truth and differentiation. He says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. This odd tangent in Paul's writing shows us an important spiritual principle, that it's possible to do the right thing for the wrong reason. It's possible to do the right thing for the wrong reason. It's true in so many parts of life, and it's especially true in the life of faith. It's also especially ironic in the life of faith because unlike in the rest of the world, God knows what our actual motives are even if we're deceiving ourselves. But here's what that can look like. It can look like using spiritual disciplines, prayer, scripture reading, fasting, whatever, as sort of an if this, then that, right? If I'm faithful by having a quiet time, then God owes me the answer I'm looking for. It can look like responding to burnout or fatigue with more activity to try and solve the problem, right? If I just try harder to fix my family, if I just work longer hours, if I just serve more at church, if I just give more generously, then things will be better. But what we do is cause ourselves to become God's employee rather than God's child. It looks like church hopping. It looks like blaming the church or Christian leaders for your own spiritual apathy usually goes with, I'm not being fed, and leaving a church in sort of the search of the non-existent perfect community. To be clear, there are valid reasons uh, for leaving churches, but if you're constantly hopping around between different congregations and none of them are meeting your needs, it's probably a sign that you're in denial about your dark night of the soul. It's not uncommon for people, myself included, to keep bumping up against the wall to sort of flow back into stage three, the productive life, instead of keeping on in the spiritual journey. It's not uncommon to do that because we're always just trying to work our way out of it. We're trying to solve the problem. We're trying to dig in harder. We're trying to put in more effort. And usually, God wants the opposite of that. If we'll let him, what he does in the dark night of the soul is unmask our true motives. He brings us face to face with our real selves, right? Part of sin is self-deception, allowing ourselves to think we have it all together when we actually don't. And so the dark night of the soul, if we'll embrace it rather than resist it, positively allows that facade to be stripped away. For the things that we've held on to for security instead of God to be taken from us, sometimes literally. A few years ago, during one of my uh, deeper and longer dark nights of the soul, Christine, who's our community life pastor, uh, led some of us in a prayer time through the book of Ecclesiastes. And she asked us to pray and allow God to reveal the places in our hearts where we'd been getting meaning, purpose, security, and peace from something other than him. And as I prayed, I found the Holy Spirit leading me to ask these two questions. These are my actual notes from that prayer time. First, why do I need to get so much meaning from achievement and success? And second, why do I care so much whether people think I'm competent or not? 
Part of my dark night was allowing God to take those things away so that he could do his work. And those things, whatever they are for you, when they're stripped away, actually are the place where we can find freedom through surrender, or a better word maybe is even abandonment. Right, when we realize that we can't work our way out of the wilderness season, the only thing left to do is to surrender completely to God. That's what freedom looks like. Freedom equals abandonment to God. The way we get through the dark night of the soul is not by working harder, but by releasing our grip. And when we release our grip, whether it's a grip of control of our circumstances, a grip of the approval from other people, the grip of power or influence or success, the grip of comfort and insulation from the difficult things in the world. When we uh, release those things instead of holding them tightly, that's where freedom shows up. The fourth thing to avoid is thinking that the main goal is for it to end. Very often, especially when you're early in the dark night experience, or maybe your first dark night experience, often the thing that you're asking God for the most is for it to stop. I remember the very first time that I was experiencing an extending, uh, extended period of spiritual dryness. I was on a long walk, and on that walk, I decided even to listen to a podcast about seasons of spiritual dryness, about wilderness times, but every single part of my being was resistant. All I wanted was for the season to end, to be able to escape it, avoid it, get out of it, and for things to go back to the way they were before. That's natural, that's normal, but it also betrays this misunderstanding of what these times are. They're not punishment, they're not a mistake, they're not a diversion, they're not a wrong turn. They're actually a means of the grace of God. God is taking, in the words of Joseph in Genesis, he's taking what has been intended for harm and turning it into good. The point of the dark night from an internal perspective is not to get through it as quickly as possible, but rather to allow the deepest work possible. And usually that takes time. Uh, Gene Edwards, in a, a really famous work on sort of spiritual authority and submission called A Tale of Three Kings, talks about uh, King David and King Saul um, this way. You can look at 1 Samuel if you need a little more context, but he says this. He says, David the sheep herder would have grown up to be King Saul II, except that God cut away the soul inside David's heart. That operation, by the way, took years and was a brutalizing experience that almost killed the patient. King Saul sought to destroy David, but his only success was that he became the instrument of God to put to death the soul who roamed around in the caverns of David's own soul. God is doing something it's often difficult, and it often takes time. But the point of the dark night of the soul is that on the other side of it, we can say with the Apostle Paul, verse 21, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul did not reach that place of abandonment and surrender overnight. It's not like the first day in Roman prison, he was probably able to write those words. It took years. Again, which is not to say that your dark night of the soul has to be years in length. It doesn't. But it is to say that God dictates the timing. Because if we dictate the timing, we're guaranteed to cut it too short. So if you're going through the dark night of the soul right now, I want to really implore you to trust that God is doing something important. He's doing something even beautiful and powerful in your life. It's something that in his sovereignty, he knows can only be formed this way. He knows it can only happen in the crucible of your dark night if it's going to last. So don't rush through it. 
Allow God to do his work even when it's uncomfortable, difficult, and painful. The last assumption to avoid is that life will be the same afterward. If you allow God to do this work, if you allow him to lead you through the valley rather than run away from it, life will not look the same. It will actually look better. If you let him strip away the pretense, if you allow him to reveal your distorted and self-serving motives, if you allow him through that stripping back to develop deeper and truer surrender and trust in your heart, if you do that, What can you expect? You can expect those three things. You can expect security of identity. I'm secure in who God says I am. You can expect peace that will go beyond any circumstance that life or the enemy throws at you. And you can expect wisdom that you can share with others. When Paul says he rejoices in his suffering... When Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain, he isn't being masochistic. He's saying that because he's had an encounter with the risen Jesus that has changed absolutely everything for him. And when I say everything, guess what I mean? Everything. He's experienced peace, security, wisdom that can only come on the other side of meeting Jesus in the midst of pain and suffering and disillusionment. Jesus said yes to his own dark night of the soul, and in doing so, allowed us to go through the journey and come out on the other side of ours, where we wouldn't just survive, but we'd experience instead his abundance. Amen? So I'd love to pray for us. Why don't you stand? And uh, I want to pray for uh, initially two groups of people, and there's a few, a few words from pre-service prayer as well, but um, if today you simply want to uh, have a willingness to surrender to God's work in your life in a fresh way, uh, we want to pray for you. Uh, but there's a second group of people Well, you sort of know what God is doing in your life, but you really don't want to say yes to it. You're like, nah, I'd I'd just rather not. Like, I don't want to go there. It's too hard. I can't even really contemplate saying yes to this. If either of those things are you, if you're sort of willing to surrender, or on the flip side, if you're absolutely unwilling to surrender, I think God wants to meet you. And so if either of those things are you, I want to encourage you, If you're willing, place your hands in front of you as just a tangible sign of saying, God, I'm I'm at least willing to be prayed for. (laughs) And let's just allow him to meet us right now. And so we pray, come, Spirit of God. Come, Spirit of God. You're here. I want to invite you to meet us. We want to say yes to surrendering all of ourselves, all of our beings, all of our desires, all of our dysfunctions. We want to lay it all before you and say, Lord, have your way. You can just make that your prayer right now. You can say, Lord, have your way. Father, we ask, would you give us soft hearts? Hearts that are willing to say yes to your leading. Hearts that are willing to walk with you even into dark and painful times. Hearts that trust you even when humanly it seems like a reach. Come, Spirit of God. Let's just wait on him. He might meet you with... uh, like a tangible sense in your body. You might sense him speaking to you. Just allow him to meet you right now.
feel like the Lord is saying that for some of you, your, um, your trial or your dark night, it's almost like it feels like it's in someone else's hands, right? They're the cause of suffering or pain or dysfunction in your life. And maybe your thought is, well, Lord, I'm willing, but he isn't or she isn't. If that's you, um, I just want to encourage you, the Lord can bring breakthrough in someone else, not just in you. And so, Father, for other people who are a part of this story, Lord, we pray, bring your breakthrough there as well. Not just in us, but in the hearts and lives that we care about, that we're connected to. Father, bring your uh, bring your heart softening there too. I'm just going to name um, a few other things that came up in pre-service prayer. And if these are you, we believe the Lord wants to meet you and encourage you to receive prayer from uh, the team after we receive communion. Uh, first, simply the idea of being pulled by a rope, having your heart pulled. And maybe you're resistant in some way, but the Lord is pulling you. If that's you, uh, we want to uh, pray for you, for you to be able to say yes to God. For others, there's a call to salvation, to come into faith in Jesus for the first time. If that's you, if you want to say yes to Jesus today, we want to pray for you. And then finally, uh, someone who uh, you don't have the words to know what to pray, the Lord wants to give you the gift of praying in the Spirit. Uh, so if you feel like, you know, there's something, but I don't have the words to pray, uh, we want to pray for you. We want to pray for the Lord to give you that gift. So, Father, we give you all of these things. We give you our hearts. We give you ourselves. We give you our situations, our concerns, and our burdens. And we say, have your way. Do what you want to do.